All right, welcome everybody to Embroidered Knots. My name is Dana. I'm the editor of Fave Crafts, and I will be emceeing today's class. If you're not familiar already, Fave Crafts is a website that shares free craft tutorials from all over the internet. And we have a variety of free email newsletters broken down by interest, like Everyday Crochet, Trash to Treasure. We have several sewing newsletters. And you can sign up for any of those newsletters at favecrafts.com. We are recording today's class, so you'll get a copy of that recording in your email tomorrow in about 24 hours. So keep an eye out for an email from Favecrafts via Zoom with that link to the recording. And then you can use either the Q&A feature or the chat to ask questions. Sometimes the chat moves kind of quickly, um, but I, we'll do our best to address all of your questions during today's class. And thank you so much to today's sponsor. So today's class is sponsored by M Creative J. Melissa Galbraith is our instructor and the fiber artist behind M Creative J. Melissa shares her love of nature through whimsical and modern hand embroidery kits, patterns, workshops, and her book, How to Embroider Texture and Pattern. Featuring 20 step-by-step -step embroidery patterns of beautiful landscapes, desert canyons, unique flora, and more. How to Embroider Texture and Pattern is filled with vibrant embroidery patterns inspired by wanderlust that will challenge and grow your skills as you bring these beautiful outdoor scenes to life. Order your copy today at mcreativej.com slash my dash book. And I will put that link in the chat. All right. With that, I'm going to stop screen sharing and I'm going to turn it over to Melissa. Welcome, Melissa. Hi, thank you so much for having me again. Welcome everyone. Um, so I am thrilled we are going to cover some different embroidered knots today. So before we get started with all of our stitching, I'm just going to prep us with getting our fabric and our hoop and our thread split apart and everything like that. So the first thing you'll want to do is take your embroidery hoop and we'll just gently unscrew the top here. And we want to do that just so the inner ring easily pops out. And you'll take that inner ring and lay it on a flat surface. Take your fabric and lay that right on top. So that way it goes around all of that ring there. And then we'll take that outer ring and sandwich those three pieces together. Just like so. And then we'll just gently tighten that top screw here. And as we do, we also want to tug our fabric towards the outside of that ring. So we get our fabric nice and taut inside of our hoop. And it's kind of a combination of tugging the uh, fabric, tightening that top screw, tugging a little more. And you'll know your fabric is tight enough when you give it a tap and it sounds like a drum. So you wanna make sure it's nice and taut. If you see any creases or kind of any dips, you want to make sure to give your fabric a little bit of a tug and then also tighten that top screw some. All right. So now that we have our fabric all nice and tight in our hoop, we want to go ahead and pick out some thread. So I grabbed this purple thread to stitch with today. You can grab any thread you want. I'm using um, the DMC cotton six strand embroidery thread so we can split it apart. When you measure out your thread, we want to hold it with the barcode at the top, find the little end that's sticking out there. And I kind of go from my nose out to my fingertips there. And that way, you know, you have enough to work with with your own arm, but not so much that your thread's going to get tangled up or caught up in the back of your piece. So once we have that measured out, we'll just cut our thread away from the skein here. So as you heard me mention, this is six strand embroidery thread, which means in that piece we just cut out, there's actually six strands of thread in there. I don't usually work with all six because it's kind of bulky and chunky. Um, so I like to split apart my thread. When I do that, I pinch the very end, grab one strand at a time and just pull straight up. So the thread bunches underneath my fingertips. And then that one strand I pulled out, I'll just lay down in front of me, flatten out that thread I pulled from before I go in for another strand. And I'm going to work with three strands of thread today. So I'll grab them one at a time here. And I like to go one at a time because if I do more than one, 
it usually becomes a big tangly knotted mess. And those are not the kind of knots we want today. <laughs> All right. So you can either use the three you have left that you um, still have that you didn't pull apart or the three you have pulled apart, either three is fine here. Just want to make sure they're nice and evenly lined up at the end. And then we'll go ahead and thread our needle, which my needle is over here. Here we go. <laughs> so I usually um, get my thread a little wet, which means I'll stick it in my mouth. You could also use things like thread gloss or some kind of beeswax to run your thread through to help it stick together. Just whatever it will do to help your thread kind of stick together nice so the thread ends aren't going all different ways. And then I'll hold my thread as close as I can to the end of my fingertips and gently glide the thread through the eye of my needle there. All right. So once I have my needle threaded, I like to have a shorter side of thread and a longer side of thread. And I do that because if I ever need to pull my needle off of the um, thread here, I can just take it right off the short end. But that also means we're only going to put a knot on one end of our thread, and I like to do the long end here. So we'll do the quilter's knot real quick this morning to get our thread going. So when you do the quilter's knot, hold your needle pointy side up in your dominant hand. We'll take the very end of our long end of thread and cross that in front of your needle so you have a little plus sign. Where those two cross, we'll pinch together between our thumb and finger that's holding the needle. And then in our other hand, we have a loop of thread. Take the top part of that loop and wrap it around our needle three times. That part just wrapped, pinch together between your thumb and finger that's holding the needle. Let go of the loop and then keep pinching everything you just wrapped as we pull our needle straight up. So see, I'm pinching right here and pulling my needle up and then I'll kind of wrap my fingers around the thread so I don't unthread my needle and keep pulling till I get to the end of my long end of thread. And there's my knot down there. So I'll do that again because I know the quilter's knot is a little funky when you first learn how to do it. <laughs> so we have our short side of thread and our long side of thread. Hold our needle, pointy side up in our dominant hand. Take the very end of our long end of thread, cross that in front of our needle so we have a little plus sign. Pinch those two together between our thumb and finger that's holding the needle. And then in our other hand, we have a loop of thread. We'll take the top part of that loop and wrap it around our needle three times. That part we just wrapped, pinch together between our thumb and finger that's holding the needle. Let go of our loop and keep pinching everything as we pull our needle straight up. And make sure to wrap your fingers around your threads so you don't unthread your needle. And you should have a knot right there. And then if you have any thread after your knot, just go ahead and trim that down. And that way it doesn't get tangled up in the back of your project or pulled through to the front of your piece. All right, now that we have a knot at the end of our thread, let's make some knots on the front of our fabric too. So we are going to start with the French knot today. And this one, you can see right here, these green, dark green stitches, that's the French knot. It's kind of like a little dot that sits raised on the front of your fabric here. You can do them individually or to kind of fill in a shape or space. I love it because it's really textural. So to do our French knot, we'll bring our needle up from the back of the fabric to the front. And you want to feel that knot in your fabric, I'm sorry, in your thread, nice and flush with the back of your fabric. And then I like to lay my hoop flat on the table so I can work with both of my hands here. All right, so we have our thread coming out of the front and we want to pinch our thread about four or five inches away from where it's coming out of the fabric with our hand that's not holding the needle. And in between where you're pinching and it's coming out of the fabric, we're going to wrap this thread around our needle here. So wrap one, two, 
three. Keep pinching our thread in the other hand as we bring our needle back down into the fabric right next to where we came up. And I just kind of stab it in there without pushing it all the way through yet. And now you'll see that all that thread is kind of loosey goosey around my needle here. I want to tug the thread that I'm holding in my other hand so that everything is nice and tightly wrapped around the needle and flush with the fabric here. And then I will push my needle on through the fabric and just gently tug until I get a cute little knot on the front there. All right. Let's do that again. So we'll bring our needle up where we want the center of the knot to be. Lay your hoop flat on the table and we'll pinch our thread so we have about four or five inches from where it's coming out of the fabric and where we're pinching it. And now that thread we're going to wrap around our needle. So wrap one, two, three. Then we'll bring our needle back down right next to where we came up. And before we push our needle all the way through the fabric, we want to give that thread in our other hand a tug so everything is nice and tightly wrapped around our needle and flush with the fabric here. Then we'll push our needle on through and just gently tug until everything becomes a knot. With the French knot, you can kind of change up how big or small you want your knot based on how many strands of thread you use or how many wraps you do around your needle. So if I wanted like a really big knot, maybe I'll wrap four, five, or six times here. So one, two, three, four, five, six. I'll do the same thing here. Just make sure everything is tightly wrapped. You see that knot's a little raised and bigger than the other ones here. And you can do smaller ones too. Maybe you only want a tiny itty bitty knot and you'll wrap once. Get something really small. You could use more threads too. And um, that would also get you a bigger knot and you would need to wrap your thread fewer times. But the important thing to remember with French knots is that it's all about tension. So that's why I like to hold my thread in this other hand all the way throughout the process to make sure everything stays nice and taut here. Just like so. How's everybody feeling about French knots? I'm not seeing any questions or anything just yet. Although Julie's, okay, great. Wow, people are saying they feel good. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, good. Yay. <laughs> some thumbs up, some goods. Wonderful. All right. So now that we're feeling pretty comfortable with the French knot, we will move on to the pistol stitch. So this one, even though it's called a stitch, I like to refer to it as a knot because it's like a straight line with a knot at the end here. Um, so it looks very similar or is done very, very similar to the French knot. It just looks a little bit different. So we will try this one next. So let me move my thread on the back here real quick. Just knotting it off and moving over so we don't have a large thread jump on the back here. All right, so when you do the pistol stitch, you want to bring your needle up right where you want the bottom of that straight line on your stitch here. So bring it on up. And this, like I said, very similar to the French knot. So I like to lay my hoop flat on the table pinch my thread about four or five inches away, and we're going to act like we're making a French knot now. So that thread we're pinching will wrap, one, two, three. And now instead of going back down right next to where our thread is coming out of the fabric, we are going to bring our needle back down 
at the top of our line where we want that um, knot to go. So we'll just stick our needle into the fabric, gently tug that thread in our other hand. So not only is the thread tightly wrapped around our needle here now, we also have this straight stitch that's on the fabric and we want to make sure that's nice flush as well too. Once we have that, then we'll push our needle on through the fabric and again, just gently tug. So you have your pistol stitch here. So let's do that again. We'll bring our needle up right where we want the bottom of our straight stitch to go. Lay our hoop flat on the table. Pinch our thread about four or five inches away. And then we'll wrap that thread around our needle three times and bring our needle back down into the fabric right where you want the top of that pistol stitch to go. So the top of your straight line, gently tug your thread so that way it's tightly wrapped around your needle and you have that um, straight stitch is also flush with the fabric. Then we'll push our needle on through. And there we go. Looks like I might have accidentally pulled my knot through on that one. Sometimes you do have to be careful about that. Let's do that again. So just like the French knot, you can play around with how big or small you want that knot at the end of your pistol stitch to be. So if I were to wrap my thread even more, around my needle here, you would get a much bigger knot. So, like so. A little bit of a bigger knot there. But with this one, you just need to make sure, along with keeping everything nice and taut and wrapped around your needle like the French knot, you want to make sure that straight stitch is also nice and flush and flat to the fabric before you push it on through the fabric here. Oh, great question, Emily. So Emily asked if you pulled the knot through like I did with that second one there at the top of my pistol stitch, would I just add a French knot to the top? Yes, you could totally do that. That's kind of like a, I don't wanna say like a cheater way to do it, but if you were to just do like a straight stitch and then put a little French knot at the top, that is an easy way to make it look like you did a pistol stitch with um, out actually doing the pistol stitch. So sometimes I know it's hard to get these straight stitches to lay nice and flush with the fabric. And if you're um, struggling with that, then just doing a straight stitch with the French knot at the top is an easy way to get a similar effect to the pistol stitch there. Let me do that again here. Bring our needle up where we want the bottom of our straight stitch. Hold our thread, wrap, and then bring our needle back down into the fabric at the top of our line here. Gently tug so everything is nice and tightly wrapped. And our straight stitch is flush with the fabric, and then push it on through like so. So there you go. Is the pistol stitch new for anybody? See a few yeses. Yay. All right. Ooh, a lot of yeses. Okay. Wonderful. <laughs> Ah, okay. So looks like Julie said when she wraps more than four times, it's hard for her to push her needle through the fabric. So sometimes the, when you wrap the thread more around the needle, it gets really taut. Um, so you do need to loosen it up a little enough so that your needle will slide easily through the fabric. 
but not so much that you have kind of like a loose um, and loopy thread around your needle. So it's a little bit about finding that balance of being able to easily slide your needle through the fabric and also being able to um, have everything nice and tightly wrapped. So great question there. And Barbara asks, what would you use this stitch for? So I've seen people use this for kind of like pistols and flowers um, as flower petals themselves. Maybe they're um, little buds on branches or like things growing in your grass and things like that. Um, I personally always think of nature when I um, stitch. So that's kind of what I think for. Yes, stamens, that's right. So that's what I like to use the stitch for, but really it's whatever your creativity can come up with and what you want to use it for. I think that's where it's, it's a really good place to try. <laughs> All right, well, we will do a quick intermission here and then we will jump in with the Boolean knot and the Danish knot. All right. Thanks so much, Melissa, for everything you've taught so far. I, I love seeing all of the the great comments about um, just how much everybody loves your teaching. So thank you so much. Um, before I talk, so I'm going to talk about upcoming classes and an offer from our digital magazines at Prime Publishing. Before I do that, I just wanted to show this slide that um, shows a couple of the pages excerpted from Melissa's book. So this is a pattern called Joshua Tree. And then there's a lot of details on this other page on the right side of the screen talking about um, different flower stitch or different ways to make flowers in the, the book. So you can see how detailed the instructions are and how beautiful the images are, uh, et cetera. So I wanted to spotlight that for everybody before I move on. All right. So we have two classes coming up in October that you can sign up for and a possible third. This class on October 10th at 11 a.m. Central is a fall napkin decoupage notebook. So we're doing a, a general craft class. Often it's crochet knitting or sewing slash embroidery needle arts. Uh, but, but we've got a general crafts class coming up, which is super exciting. That's with Eileen Hull. If you guys are familiar, she does 3D die cuts uh, to make things like a notebook or boxes, etc. So you can sign up for that at favecrafts.eventbrite.com. We also have a stranded knitting class coming up. That's the following week, October 17th, also at 11 a.m. Central. That is with Molly Conroy from the Hands-On Knitting Center. So if any of you attended our Brioche Simplified class back in July, same instructor for that class. So that's coming up on October 17th and you can sign up for that one as well. The last class, I'm thinking about teaching a class at the end of the month or early November. It um, depends on if our third child arrives early or not. Uh, but if folks have any preferences or are interested in either of these topics, there's either a waffle stitch tutorial with a moss stitch border or alpine stitch where you change colors every three rows and carry the colors up the sides. And that's with a camel stitch border. So I'm curious your thoughts. Uh, feel free to drop them in the chat if there's any particular class you're interested in. Otherwise I might teach one or both of these in the spring, we'll see. Um, so stay tuned for that. And then as a thank you for everybody who attends our Favecraft Studio Live classes, we offer uh, a introductory offer for our digital magazines. So new subscribers can get an annual subscription of any of our magazines. We like sewing, I like crochet, and or I like knitting for just $5 US for the year. And that gets you six digital issues of the magazines, as well as access to all of the previously published patterns, which is pretty cool. That's the advantage of, of a digital magazine. The link to get any of those offers is the magazine name.com. So we like sewing.com. I like crochet.com. I like knitting.com slash virtual 23. And I will include those links in the chat as well. 
All right, I think that's everything. That's a lot from me. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the screen share and turn it back over to Melissa. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I think you had a quick question about whether the potential class was knitting or crochet. Oh, thank you. Yeah, they're both crochet for the potential class. So thank you. But before we dive into our last two stitches here, a few people were asking what you would use the pistol stitch for. So I grabbed a couple samples. So you can see kind of these yellow stitches here inside these flowers. I used the pistol stitch for that one on this piece here. And then this is one of the pieces from my book. So you can see these little purple flowers down here at the bottom. Those are also pistol stitches. Um, so they're kind of like little standalone flowers in there. So those are two examples of the pistol stitch. Um, our next stitch we're going to do is the bullion knot. So you can see it on this piece here as well too. Um, it looks kind of like these long um, knots here. I always think they look a little bit like worms, but they make some fun texture as well too if you want to fill in or they can be standalone as well too. So these purple stitches right here are also just the bullion knot on their own. Grabbed some paper to stick underneath my hoop stand here so you can see this a little easy. So the bullion knot, is just looks like a little bar when you go to stitch it. So you'll bring your needle up on one side of the bar here. Feel our knot nice and flush at the back of the fabric. And then we want to bring our needle back down into the other end of that bar and pop it back up through the fabric right next to where our thread is coming out of the fabric. So it's almost like you're stitching backwards. We're bringing our needle into the fabric and then coming back up right next to where our thread is coming out. So once we've done that, I'd like to kind of pop my needle up underneath my finger here and that thread that's coming out of the fabric, we are going to wrap around our needle and we want to wrap it enough so that it's going to fill in this space here. So I'll wrap, just keep wrapping. And let's smush them down on my needle there. You can see that space, that wrap part is kind of close to that fill. So maybe do a few more. All right, so that, number of wraps look similar to the space that I have here. So once I have that, I'm going to pinch them together between my fingers and gently pull my needle through the fabric and keep on pulling here. So it'll kind of look like I have my wrap part stacked up on one side with a thread coming out of it. So then I want to pull towards the other side of that bar smush everything down, and then bring my needle back down into the fabric right on the other side, like so. So let's do that again, because I know it's really funky when you first do it. So I'll do this vertical one here. So we'll bring our needle up on one side of our line, pop our needle down at the other end and then push it back up right next to where we started. So we'll kind of put our finger underneath our needle here and that thread that's coming out of the fabric we are going to wrap around our needle. So wrap. And we want to kind of smush those wraps down our needle here to fill in this space. There we go, that looks pretty close. All right, then we will pinch it all together, push our needle through the fabric. And sometimes you kind of have to wiggle your needle a bit if, it's, if your um, thread is tightly wrapped there. And then gently tug, pull your thread towards the other side of that line and smush everything down and then go back down to the other end 
have your line there. So let's do it again. Bring our needle up on one end of our line. Pop our needle back down to the fabric on the other and then back up right next to where we've started. I like to put a finger underneath my needle here and then we'll wrap. And push all those wraps down. Oh, without pushing our needle through the fabric. Looks like we're going to need a few more here. All right, so that looks pretty close. I usually try to go for more wraps than um, less because if you have less, they're not going to fill in that space. If there's more, it's just going to sit a little um, further away from the fabric. So have our thread nice and tightly wrapped on our needle. Pinch it all together. Pull our needle on through here. I'll wiggle it up. All right. So all of our thread is kind of wrapped around one side. Push it down, pull towards the other side of our line. And go back down into the fabric at the other end of it. How is everyone feeling about the bullion knot? All right, Linda likes it, that's good. <laughs> oh, I see a frowny face. Okay, all right. A few people are saying it's a little funky. So those of you that are kind of having a little bit of trouble with it, what, let's see if we can do this again and get some of that sorted out. So we want to bring our needle up at one end of our line here. Now we will Bring our needle back down at the other end of our line and then pop it back up right next to where our thread is coming out of the fabric. And then I like to put a finger underneath my needle here and that thread that's coming out of the fabric, we will wrap around our needle. So we want to keep that nice and tight, just like we have with our other knots here. We want to have enough thread wrapped around our needle to fill in this space we have. So I think we're pretty close. All right, so everything we have wrapped around our needle, you want to pinch together between your thumb and finger, and then we'll pull our needle through the fabric with our other hand here. So keep pinching everything you wrapped as we pull our needle on through. And sometimes with your thread that's, when you've wrapped so many times around your needle, it can be hard to pull it through. So you have to wiggle it a little bit just to kind of pull it on through. And so everything is kind of wrapped up on one side of our line here. And we have this straight bit of thread. So we want to then bring pull our thread towards the other side of our line here and push all those wraps down along our thread here. So they fill in that space. Then we'll bring our needle back down at the other end of our line to finish up our bullion knot there.
Phyllis says hers look like fat little caterpillars. <laughs> I love that. Yes, yeah, the more times you wrap or if your thread is a little more loosely wrapped around your needle, it can be a little puffier and chunkier. Also, if you use more strands of thread, it will also give you that little bit of a thicker wrap here. Um, I'm using three strands of thread, so mine aren't super thick and chunky, um, but you can kind of change the width of your wrap based on how many strands of thread you use to wrap there. Right. Yay, and Karen finally got one too. Yes, pulling th the needle through the fabric is kind of the hard part with the bullion knot because after you've wrapped your thread around your needle so many times, it can be kind of hard to then pull your needle through all of that. So sometimes I kind of have to wiggle my needle back and forth a little bit as I'm trying to get it through um, to make sure everything is still evenly wrapped, like tightly wrapped around my needle um, to keep the tension nice there. Well, it looks like we got a few more bullion knots and a few people who say they want to practice some more. So that's always good. Um, I know learning new stitches can be kind of funky when you first do them, um, but I'm glad everyone wants to at least give it a try and keep on going here. All right. And then Emily asks, what's the minimum and maximum number of strands that you typically use? Um, that's a very good question. So... I think it kind of depends on what you're stitching, what you're stitching on, and also what kind of like textures you're wanting to create. Um, when you work with like thinner, more delicate fabric, you do want to use fewer strands of thread instead of something that's really thick and chunky. If you have a sturdier or more open weave fabric, you can get away with using much thicker thread. Um, personally, I usually use anywhere from like two to like four strands of thread for most projects. Um, if I'm doing some like really detailed stitches, I might do like one or two strands of thread and kind of blend them together or do details on top of other things I've stitched. Um, but it kind of just, again, depends on the project. It depends on the fabric um, and again, what I'm making. So I really encourage you to experiment and explore and kind of see what you like. Um, I would say personally, I don't usually stitch with all six strands of thread just because it can be very chunky and thick. Um, but if you are working on a much more like open weave fabric or something that's sturdier, you can get away with using six or, you know, even more than that. Um, but yeah, play around and see what you enjoy. All right, so let's go ahead and try the Danish knot next. So this one is a triangular knot. You can see these hot pink knots here that look a little bit like triangles. We're going to do the Danish knot. Um, and then I also grabbed another piece here from my book. These um, orange flowers here in this field, those are Danish knots as well too. So let me get my thread ready to go. And for this one, um, I am going to use six strands of thread just so it's a little easier to see and this triangle fills in a little better. Um, I know I just said I don't normally work with all six strands of thread, but um, this is one of those stitches that's a little bit of an exception. <laughs> So for our Danish knot, we want to start, um, if you can, I would either visualize a triangle or draw a triangle out on your fabric to make this a little easier. So we want to bring our needle up at the top of our triangle. And then we are going to make a straight stitch down one side here. So go down in the bottom corner. So it'll look like we have a nice straight stitch along our triangle. Next, we'll bring our needle up in the other bottom corner of that triangle there. All right, and now we want to bring our needle 
gosh, I'm having a moment. Um, underneath that straight stitch. Oh, sorry, wrong way. Doing this backwards. All right. Underneath our straight stitch towards where our thread is coming out of the fabric right here. So our needle is above where the thread is coming out of the fabric. So again, straight stitch, slide your needle under that straight stitch above where your thread is coming out of the fabric. And we'll gently pull our thread through like so. And now we're going to do that again. So slide your needle underneath that straight stitch. And now we kind of have this loose thread right here. We want to make sure that is underneath our needle. And then we'll pull our thread through and tug just so everything is nice and flush with the fabric and fills in our triangle there. And then we go back down in that bottom corner again. Just like so. That's our Danish knot. Let me do that again. So we start right at the top point of our triangle. And then we make a straight stitch down one side. So bring our needle in down in that bottom corner. Next, we want to bring our needle up in the corner we haven't been in yet. And now we're going to slide our needle underneath that straight stitch and above our thread that is coming out of the fabric here. Gently pull our thread so that it's nice and flush with the fabric here. And we want to do this again. So slide our needle underneath that straight stitch. And this thread that is attached to that um, part that's still coming out of the fabric, we want to make sure our needle goes over that. Then we'll push our needle on through and gently tug so everything is flush with the fabric but not too tight so that our triangle looks a little distorted. We just want a good solid fill there. And then we'll bring our needle back down in that bottom corner again, like so. Let's go again. Bring our needle up in that top corner, the very tippy top of our triangle. Bring our needle down in one of the bottom corners of our triangle here. Next, we'll come up in that other corner of our triangle we haven't worked with yet. All right, now we want to slide our needle underneath our straight stitch towards where our thread is coming out of the fabric and make sure your needle goes above that thread that is coming out of the fabric there. Gently tug so that thread is now flush with the fabric. So it'll kind of look like you have a straight line with a thread that's coming up from that corner and looping around that straight stitch. And we want to do this again. So we'll bring our needle underneath that straight stitch we made. We want to go over that thread that's coming out of the fabric again, then push our needle on through and gently tug so everything is nice and flush with the fabric there. And then again, go back down in that bottom corner. There we go. That is our Danish knot. So a few people say they like this one. Um, Sonia says hers looks like an upside down Y. So if you pull your thread too tightly on the Danish knot, it will kind of smush everything together towards the center and not give you that solid fill that you want. So with this one, we want to, when you kind of run your thread underneath that straight stitch, you want to make sure it lays nice and flush 
with the fabric um, and not pull as tightly with this one. Um, I also, the reason I used six strands of thread with this instead of the three I was originally using for some of our other stitches is so that it would fill in that triangle a little more. If your triangle is much bigger um, and we're kind of doing this stitch, it might not fill in as much. That could also be why it looks a little bit like an upside down Y or a V that some people might be getting. So I would try um, not pulling your thread as tightly so that way you get a little bit more of a fill with your Danish knot. And then Monica says, where would you use this on a landscape? So you can kind of use this really wherever you want. I have used these um, Danish knots to kind of fill in sections of rock formations. Um, you can see I use them in this landscape to kind of fill in some flowers here, these orange flowers um, on this field here. Um, really whatever kind of design you want to create that has this texture is where you could use it. And a few people have asked for me to do it again. So let's do it. All right. So for our Danish knot, we'll bring our needle up at the top of our triangle here. We want to make a straight stitch down one side. Then we want to bring our needle up in that corner we haven't stitched in yet. All right, so now we want to slide our needle underneath that straight stitch towards our thread that's coming out of the fabric and make sure our needle is above where that thread is coming out of the fabric here. So you can see it's above here. And we're going to gently tug that thread. is nice and flush with the fabric, but we're not seeing that like straight line distort in any way. We want to make sure it's all nice and flush with the fabric. So let's do it again, where we slide our needle underneath that straight stitch again. And this time you want to make sure to go over that thread that com is coming out of the fabric. We have our thread going over this thread that's coming out of the fabric as we stitch downwards again. Gently tug. So again, everything is filled in, but not too tight that we're seeing any of the threads pulling. And then we'll bring our needle back down in that corner of our little Danish knot, and there we go. How's everybody feeling about the Danish knot? A few people that like it, got it. A um, few people it's not working for yet. All right, let's go ahead. We can. We still have time, so let's let's do it again. So we want to bring our needle up at the top of our triangle. We'll bring our needle back down. I like to go in the bottom left corner there because I'm right-handed. And then I'll bring my needle up in that bottom right corner, right there. Right, so now we slide our needle underneath that straight stitch towards where our thread is coming out of the fabric and make sure our needle goes above where the thread's coming out of the fabric. Just gently tug so your thread is nice and flush with the fabric here. Then we want to do that again. So slide our needle underneath that straight stitch and make sure your needle goes, see this thread I have on the side that's coming out of the fabric? I want to make sure my needle goes over that. It's almost like it's making a little bit of a loop. 
And then again, gently tug. So everything's flush with the fabric. And then we go back down in that bottom corner again, just like so. That is your Danish knot. I know this one is kind of tricky because you go under and over your thread and you have to have a thread in the right spot here, um, but you will get there. Let's see. Phil says hers is wrapping around the first stitch. Um, so you should be wrapping your thread around that straight stitch there. So let me see. So when we come up from the top here and we make that straight stitch down one side of our triangle, we are going to wrap our thread around this straight stitch here. So we bring our needle up in that other bottom corner. Nope, oh, that is not the bottom corner. There we go, in that bottom corner. So we are going to wrap our thread around the straight stitch here. So slide our needle underneath that straight stitch and over where our thread is coming out of the fabric. So your thread wraps around that straight stitch there. And then we want to do this again. So to kind of get that triangular look, then we go underneath that straight stitch and we need to make sure to bring our needle over this thread that's coming out of the fabric here. If you don't bring your needle over this thread, it will then kind of wrap more, it won't give you that triangular look. So second time we slide our needle underneath that straight stitch and over our thread that's coming out of the fabric here. Gently tug. Then we'll bring our needle back down in that bottom corner again. There we go. All right. Yay. All right. Well, it looks like a few people said it took them a little while, but they finally got it or it's starting to look more like the triangles that they want for the Danish knot. So I'm glad to hear that. And Karen said she wrapped a few more times, which you can definitely do. So if you have like a larger space to fill, you could um, go um, do multiple loops around there and that will kind of fill it in nicely. I love the variation. Oh, yeah. And Emily was wondering if I draw my images out on my fabric with anything. Um, let me grab that. Yeah. So, um. The pen I use today for this sample piece is a heat erasable pen. It's called a Pilot Frixion erasable pen. Um, they come in a variety of different colors, um, but pretty much you can draw directly onto your fabric and then it will disappear with um, heat. So an iron or a blow dryer. They also make other options out there that are like water soluble pens, chalk pens or pencils. Um, you can use carbon paper. Um, they also make... Uh, like water soluble transfer patterns that you could use that you would pin on or that stick on kind of like stickers um, and those would wash away as well too. Um, but I really enjoy the Pilot Frixion pen because it's pretty easy to just draw directly onto whatever you want. And then if you don't end up following those lines or change your mind, they just disappear with heat. Um, so using like a blow dryer or an iron is a really easy way to do that. <laughs> yes, Joanne, I did embroider the strawberries on my jacket here. Um, 
I was at a, an event this summer and it was in a tri like convention center that was so cold and you know it was like Las Vegas in the summer where it was like 110 degrees outside but inside it was freezing so I ended up going to the store and finding a sweater that they had there and then of course like in the evenings when I didn't have much to do I was like oh well this this could use a little embroidery so I did some strawberries on there which made it pretty fun. <laughs> Well, thank you everyone for joining me today. I hope you learned maybe a new stitch or two and had fun. Um, all of these stitches are included in my book. So if you wanted to practice them some more and learn more stitches, you can find it in my book, How to Embroider Texture and Pattern as well. Thank you, Melissa. I I have been paging through your book because I have a copy. <laughs> and I, um, I just, I love it so much. The first half of the book practically is stitch tutorials and then you get into the specific mm -hmm. patterns and they're so beautiful and detailed with the step out photos so highly recommend well, to everybody <laughs> um I'm just going to share our last uh slide which shows um if you guys aren't following Melissa on social media yet her handle is mcreativej uh, she's very active on Instagram. I follow her closely on Instagram these days. Um, so definitely check out any of her social media and visit her website as well. So of course you can get her book at her website, but then she has a lot of other products and kits. And is that pen you were talking about available on your site by chance, Melissa? Um, it's not. You can find it at most um, like craft stores, office supply stores, and Amazon and things like that. Um, but if you want the Pilot Brixion erasable pen, it's pretty easy to find. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Um, but yeah, yeah. So check out her website, mcreativej.com to, to see what else there is to offer. If you have questions for me about Fave Craft Studio live classes, feedback, etc., you can email me directly at deanneald at primecp.com. And thank you again, everyone, so much for joining today. Thank you, Melissa, so much for teaching. Our folks loved the class. It's wonderful. And, and we really appreciate your time. So, well, thank that. you. Yeah. All right. We'll say um, have a great day, everybody. And, and keep an eye out for the recording tomorrow, too. All right. Thank Adios. you. <laughs>